presented by Caltech. Good afternoon, and welcome to Caltech's convocation. Uh, I'm Manila Sargent. I'm Vice President for Student Affairs, and I'm also a professor of astronomy. And in addition, I was a graduate student here and a postdoc here. And so I think I know how a lot of you may be feeling today. And I'd just like to say that honestly, if you have as much fun here as I've had, you'll have a great life and a great time here. Um, now, Convocation is our formal welcome to Caltech for new undergraduates, new graduate students, new postdocs, and their families and friends who've come with them for this momentous occasion. Um, but it's also, I'd like you to understand for this year, a particularly special year for Caltech because we are also welcoming our ninth president. On July 1st, Dr. Thomas Rosenbaum, the Sonia and William Davido Presidential Professor and Professor of Physics, took office um, as, our, as Caltech's ninth president. And the entire Caltech community will be celebrating his inauguration uh, in, on October 24th. I think all of you may well rejoice because the provost has declared this a holiday, an academic holiday, so you will have time <laughs> off uh, to think about what's going on. <laughs> uh, um, now, Dr. Rosenbaum comes to us um, after a distinguished 30-year uh, career at the University of Chicago. Um, he was uh, the John T. Wilson Distinguished Service Professor of Physics um, and had served uh, as a provost for the last seven years at the University of Chicago. In addition, he has had considerable involvement with the Argonne National Laboratory, and you can see that the search committee thought about the parallels between Caltech, JPL, Chicago, Argonne, and so on. So there are lots and lots of reasons why we're absolutely delighted to have um, uh, Dr. Rosenbaum with us. Um, he is, in fact, um, a, a condensed matter physicist um, and studies really the uh, nature of, under, of matter, particularly understanding it um, at temperatures close to absolute zero, um, which is quite a triumph. Uh, Dr. Rosenbaum received his bachelor's degree from Harvard and his uh, MA and PhD from Princeton. He has received many honors, including Sloan Fellowships and a, been a presidential young investigator. Um, he's a fellow of the American Physical Society, um, uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Academy for Arts and Sciences. So you can see that uh, he has quite a background uh, to impress us all with. In addition, we are absolutely delighted to have joining our faculty at this same time uh, Dr. Rosenbaum's spouse, uh, Dr. Catherine Faber. Uh, she was formerly the Walter Murphy Professor of Materials Science and Engineering at Northwestern University. And she will be Simon Ramo Professor of Materials Science here. Um, equally distinguished, she too has several awards to her name, like her husband, and also is a fellow of the American Academy for Arts and Sciences. Um, her research uh, focuses on understanding the properties of ceramics. Of course, these, this has many uh, scientific and engineering applications. But in addition, as you can perhaps imagine, it has uh, artistic uh, relevance as well. And so uh, Dr. Faber actually was a major player in the Northwestern University Art Institute um, for Scientific Studies um, program uh, when she was in Chicago. So really we have brought um, enormous, like a, a broad spectrum of talent in having our new president. And I hope that you will welcome him as he welcomes you and the, the new incoming class and incoming postdocs to Caltech for the first time. Thank you. Well, welcome to one of the great universities of the world. Uh, throughout its history, the California Institute of Technology has ventured into unexplored realms, defining new fields in science and engineering, 
and pushing interdisciplinary boundaries in the service of discovery. We are fearless in attacking large and important problems at scale, from the nature of the chemical bond to quarks and quasars to the structure of the brain. Caltech's unflinching commitment to scientific leadership is notably expressed in the fabrication and operation of instrumentation that reveals nature in unexpected dimensions, whether through the world's largest telescopes, rovers gambling on Mars, and planetary probes hurtling beyond the confines of our solar system, a seismological network of unprecedented scale, or the development of tiny implantable medical devices to improve human well-being. The audacity and ambition of your new intellectual community to find the cultural capital that, that aligns and knits together Caltech students, faculty, and staff. Together, we work to set the example of what the intertwined mission of research and education can accomplish. Commencement speeches, claimed cartoonist Gary Trudeau, were invented largely in the belief that outgoing college students should never be released into the world until they had been properly sedated. <laughs> By contrast, convocation speeches offer the opportunity to awaken entering students to the manifold opportunities offered in their new academic setting. But the pathways are not always clearly marked, and there are many things that you cannot learn except by exploring and experimenting. In this welcome, I should like to offer a few guideposts along the road of your explorations. You are part of an extraordinarily diverse group of students. The 950 undergraduates alone at Caltech are drawn from 46 states and 26 countries. A heterogeneous assembly of scholars, students, and faculty alike necessarily brings to bear a broad range of perspectives and methodologies to the problems of the day and of the ages. This diverse population of scholars, namely you, your peers, and your teachers, must be nurtured in an environment in which you are free to express your ideas boldly and fully and have those ideas challenged and rebutted, shaped and honed. Iron refined by fire becomes steel, not because it becomes purer, but because additions to the mix, elemental carbon in this case, strengthening it. Refining by the fire of ideas, drawn from diverse perspectives, rigorous argument, and data-driven claims leads to transformation. You will face, however, the normal human tendency to narrow your world and seek comfort through closest association with those who look like you and think like you. The first guidepost about securing the most from your education, then, is the necessity to engage with a wide diversity of peers and teachers and together to test and sharpen your ideas. There's an old Spanish proverb that if a book falls from a high shelf and hits you on the head and makes an empty sound, then it may not necessarily be the fault of the book. <laughs> you will crack open many books as you master the intricacies of science and engineering, but a full, resonant education requires much more. You need to move beyond simple coursework and delve deeply into a subject at the boundaries of discovery, an opportunity afforded by performing research, both in the summer through surf and during the year. You need to understand other cultures and perspectives, perhaps firsthand through study abroad. You need to take advantage of the theater and arts and music on campus to explore Pasadena's treasures, the Huntington Library and Gardens, the Norton Simon Museum, and to sample the cultural accoutrements of the second largest city in the United States, Los Angeles. The poet William Carlos Williams wrote, it is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. 
A humanistic education helps us to function as life thrusts us into situations where we have to conceive problems outside of the structures that define them. It provides us with an elasticity of thought and familiarity of experience not fully our own, while challenging us to define the essence of what we believe. You are about to enter into a world rich in tradition and deeply connected to the greatest achievements of humanity. Most exciting, it is a dynamic world that is ready to be sculpted by the power of your ideas. Your parents, siblings, loved ones, and friends have helped prepare you for this grand adventure, and they will continue to be there, albeit at more of a distance, to help you discern the guideposts of your college education. I wish you the joy of discovery as you commence your journey. Thank you, Dr. Rosenbaum. I'd now like to uh, turn to the main part of our program and introduce uh, our guest speaker, who is Professor Alan Weinstein. What we really want to do at this time in the convocation is give all of you a flavor, particularly the visitors, for what Caltech is like, the experience of listening to a Caltech faculty member. This is always a novel experience, even though uh, for those of us who've been here quite a long time, so I hope that uh, you will enjoy this. I should say that um, Professor uh, Weinstein himself discovered physics and his passion for it, he tells me, as a college freshman. Um, and he'd always been drawn to it and to the studying the interactions that govern nature at its most basic level and how they manifest themselves in natural phenomena. Remember, physics started life as natural philosophy. It really is a study of the natural phenomenon, far removed from human experience. Alan began his career studying, as he says, the physics of the very small elementary particles and their fundamental quantum relativistic interactions using particle colliders at Stanford and Cornell and CERN, the um, Center for Nuclear Research in Geneva, um, the International Center. Fifteen years ago, he changed directions completely and began exploring what we might call the physics of the very large, gravitational waves from exotic and fascinating objects like neutron stars and black holes, supernovae, and maybe even the Big Bang. He works with the Caltech-based, and I'm going to say this slowly so you'll understand where the acronym comes from, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, but we call it LIGO, much easier, which is a unique new way to observe the universe. He anticipates the discovery of gravitational waves and the study of their properties in, and the properties of their sources. He's going to tell you why this is so interesting, because I'm sure it sounds, uh, as I have explained it to you right now. Um, and uh, I should also add that he's been on the faculty since 1988. He really is very enthusiastic about undergraduate education and undergraduates. And as a, one example is that he has taken on the role of a freshman advisor, where you will see that freshmen are advised academically in groups by one rather motivated uh, faculty member. I can only say those of you um, who are, find yourselves in Professor Weinstein's group are very fortunate indeed. But now we'll hear about what uh, he does at Caltech and how he transmits uh, this uh, information. Dr. Weinstein, thank you. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is it working? Good. OK. And uh, welcome, everybody, to Caltech. It's uh, always delightful to see all these fresh new faces. Um, I assume your faces will remain fresh for the entire time that you're here. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to them getting even fresher. Um, uh, you're getting to know Caltech a little bit today. I just want to tell um, our new president that this is how professors dress at Caltech. Um, <laughs> 
It's a little different in Chicago, but, um, well, not all professors, but anyway, um, I'm rarely seen without a, a Hawaiian t-shirt. I always dream of actually one day taking a little time off and going to Hawaii. It's still on my list. Okay, so um, uh, I want to tell you about gravitational waves, but actually, more importantly, I want to tell you why I even care about gravitational waves at all, because it may not be so obvious to most of you. And, um, uh, Maybe you might care about gravitational waves uh, a little bit, if I can tell you the motivations. Also, I don't have a whole lot of time to talk about gravitational waves. It's a big subject, of course, as you can imagine. And um, uh, I'm not the only one at Caltech who loves the thing. Let's see. Actually, I think this might work. Who loves the, uh, the phenomenon. There's actually quite a lot of people at Caltech. We have this thing called the Caltech JPL Association for Gravitational Wave Research, Kajagwar. Um, we, we, we wanted to have an animal kind of a, you know, um, uh, logo, but instead I guess the logo is, um, a couple of years ago we had this fantastic sound and light show right here, um, uh, sponsored by Kajagwar. So that's our, our sort of explosion logo. And we, you'll hear a lot about explosions, I think, today. Um, if you want to learn more about gravitational waves, you're only going to get a very small taste of it today. But don't despair. If you're a freshman, and especially a freshman who's thinking about studying physics or astronomy, you're probably going to take Physics 10, which is run by um, Tom Prince over here. Um, uh, I'll have an opportunity to tell you uh, um, a little bit about Tom's contributions to gravitational waves. Um, if you're an entering graduate student in physics, you'll probably take Physics 242. That's run by Ed Stone over there. Um, amongst other things, he continues to be uh, the mission scientist for the Voyager spacecraft. You may know that the Voyager spacecraft is one of our first and best interplanetary probes. It's now our first interstellar probe. It's beyond the solar system. Um, and Ed will get a chance to talk to you about that if you're in, um, in Physics 242. These are both pizza classes, so I encourage you to come for the pizza and stay for the science. OK, so um, let's see. Um, why? <laughs> why do I study gravitational waves? It's a pretty exotic phenomenon, I have to say. And you know, most of the time, I'm, I'm a human being like you guys, and most of the time I think about our human world. I probably have 98% of my brain thinking about the human world all the time. There's another 1% or 2% that thinks about other things. And um, uh, the, there are plenty of scientists at Caltech and elsewhere who devoted their careers and continue to devote their careers to studying the, the nature of the human world and, and addressing some of the unique problems in the human world, uh, the environment, energy, uh, the medicine and, 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 uh, and health, um, the brain, how it works, public policy. Uh, we study how voting works. Um, all kinds of things very relevant, and a day doesn't go by that I am not grateful that these scientists are devoting their lives to helping understand the, the world around, the human world around us, and helping us to solve some of the, those, uh, those human problems. But I'm not one of those guys. Um, I tend, have always been drawn be, uh, to phenomena far beyond the human experience because, well, for lots of reasons, um, if, if only because just focusing on the human world is kind of a little, how shall I say, anthropocentric, you know, human-centered. There's a whole world, or at least in the physical world, beyond human experience that turns out to be incredibly fascinating. And physicists are especially fascinated by phenomena far removed from the human experience. Why? Because you really get to learn new things. Because phenomena far removed from the human experience are unfamiliar to us, and, it gets to, and our eyes open wide. Not just our eyes, but the extensions of our eyes that we need to invent in order to, to, uh, to observe uh, the, the universe. Microscopes and telescopes and beyond that we need to extend our senses, our eyes, our ears, even our sense of touch and beyond to new kinds of senses. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about a new kind of sense that we want to open up, not with what we were born with, but with what we have developed in order to sense aspects of the physical world around us that are far removed from human experience, from which we might learn quite a lot. Now, one way of visualizing phenomena far removed from the human experience is just by looking at length scales. And you've probably all seen things like this. Here's a little length scale over here. And, um, uh, right in the middle, on scales of about one meter, are puppy dogs. 
And puppy dogs, let me, don't get me wrong, I love puppy dogs. They're fascinating. They are the center of much of my world, especially their cute little wet noses. Um, and they are on human scale. I can get to know them pretty darn well. But when you look um, with extensions to our senses, like microscopes or telescopes, you can see things far removed from the human scale, just uh, on, on the scale of, of distances. Uh, things is uh, a, a phenomena at very, very short distances or very, very small scales, and things very, very large scales. So this is the physics of the very small and the physics of the very large. And it really is an eye-opening experience to explore these things. And I encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to check out some classics like the Powers of Ten video that you'll find on, on YouTube, uh, or there's a whole bunch of variations on the subject. It really does open your eyes to the fact that the the physical world is, um, has an, extends far beyond what we normally can experience. When we look at the microscopic world, we see that, that matter is structured in a hierarchical kind of a way, from, from materials to uh, molecules to atoms uh, to nuclei to the protons and neutrons inside the nuclei, which have quarks inside of them and electrons spinning around them. And, um, What's below that? It, does this go on forever, like, uh, like peeling layers of, of an onion? Do we ever get to the bottom, to something truly fundamental from which everything is made? We don't know because we are near the limits of our ability. But that's not going to stop us. We're going to keep probing and learn more about what happens at smaller and smaller distances. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you to memorize just a few things. Memorize this number, 10 to the minus 10 meters. That's an angstrom. That's the size of an atom, characteristic size of an atom. And here's this number, 10 to the minus 15 meters, one Fermi meter. That's the size of a proton inside of a nucleus of an atom. And here are the limits of our ability to understand really, really small things, about 10 to the minus 18 meters. Try to memorize those numbers. I'm going to need them later. When we turn to the physics of the very large, well, the world gets really big. <laughs> and uh, from the Earth to solar systems, uh, the Milky Way galaxy, our local group of galaxies, the local group is part of what's called the so-called Virgo supercluster of galaxies. There's lots of superclusters of galaxies. But when we look at the very largest scales that we can with our very most powerful telescopes, we see an almost uniform uh, distribution of clusters of galaxies uh, at extremely large scales. That's the observable universe. Not the entire universe, just what we can observe with our telescopes today. And um, the, what we find when we study the physics of the very small is that the laws that govern the, the, the dynamics, the properties of atoms and smaller things are the laws of quantum mechanics. When we look at the physics of the very large, we see that gravity governs the laws, uh, governs the dynamics of matter. Um, we've, we've developed incredibly powerful tools to extend our senses. Some of the tools of the trade and some of the Caltech professors who've been involved in this kind of thing um, include the, the Large Hadron Collider at, the, um, uh, at CERN. Uh, it's, this is, um, this is uh, uh, Geneva over here. So it's the size of a city. Okay, um, and it's for studying very, very small things, the smallest things we possibly can. Uh, here's a couple of uh, Caltech professors who've been deeply involved in that work and developing these, uh, the, the tools and using them to study the properties of matter in those smallest scales, including finding the Higgs and looking beyond. Um, and the physics of the very large, oh, well, here's uh, one, of, uh, one of our dreams. Here's a 30-meter telescope that uh, Judy and her colleagues in astronomy are uh, planning on building in the top of uh, Mauna Kea in, in Hawaii. Uh, it's the, it'll be the largest telescope in the world. Oh, look, here's Anila. Um, this was um, in her previous life as the director of the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. That's where Greg wants to put a whole new set of radio telescopes in the future to really um, uh, scan the, the radio sky um, continuously. Um, uh, and uh, Neela was the past president of the American uh, Astronomical Society when she was trying to run this place. She did a, um, and it and has made many, many great discoveries. So the tools of the trade are just as important as what you learn from them. And we continue at Caltech to develop these things. Now, what we use with these, do with these tools is study the fundamental interactions, the fundamental properties, the fundamental dynamics of space and time and matter and energy. And um, what we've learned is that what we've built up is this standard model, if you like, of the fundamental forces of nature from the very familiar one, electromagnetism, 
which governs the properties of light, but also the structure of atoms and how atoms bind together into molecules, but also uh, forces that are short range and hard to study without special tools, the nuclear forces that govern the structure of nuclear matter. And these are all quantum mechanical forces. Uh, they're, they're described in terms of quantum field theory, and they come together in this so-called standard model. And we know that the standard model of particle physics is not the whole story. We know that there's more beyond it. There's maybe things called supersymmetry and grand unification, and we're, look, we're pushing our ability to study these tiny systems um, to ever um, shorter distances and higher energies in order to see what's beyond just because it's there not because it's necessarily uh, of any uh, use to, um, uh, to the human world, per se, um, except maybe to maybe enrich us to the point where the human world is not just savable, but worth saving. Um, the, um, th these quantum forces are, are um, uh, uh, we uh, allow us to, to infer that the entire, all of nature is quantum mechanical in some very deep way that we're trying to understand. By contrast, here is gravity. And gravity governs, as I said, the physics of the very large, from planets on up. And it's pretty obvious to us uh, that gravity is, uh, holds sway on our scales, on the human scale. But our understanding of it is much deeper than that. By studying things uh, on the scale of planets and beyond, we've found that gravity, and in particular Einstein's theory of it, the general theory uh, of relativity, tells us not just about the behavior of matter and energy, but also the very nature of space and time itself. Turns out space and time are dynamical, and that's what Einstein's theory tells us about. And we want to understand this better as well. The problem with this is that there's nothing quantum mechanical about that theory at all. In fact, it tends to conflict in some ways with quantum mechanics. We know, I'll tell you why, we know that quantum mechanics governs everything, not just the very small, but also the very large. And, um, uh, and trying to have, understand how gravity um, connects with quantum mechanics, a, qu a quantum theory of gravity, is one of the great frontiers of fundamental science. And there are plenty of Caltech professors who are busy working hard on that kind of thing. We might think that string theory is the answer. And here's some of uh, uh, the people who've developed uh, who developed string theory over the years and are using it to try to get a deeper understanding of the connection between gravity and the quantum forces that hold sway in, um, uh, in the physics of the very, very small. Now, I should say that quantum mechanics does describe atoms and smaller things. It's the physics of the very, very small, but it does govern things even bigger than atoms. In fact, it should govern all of matter and all of matter, energy, space, and time. And there's now a great um, interest in understanding how the laws of quantum mechanics might reveal themselves, even in big things, things on the scale of a human being, so-called macroscopic quantum mechanics. We even have a whole institute of quantum information and matter here at Caltech that's devoted to understanding mm, a lot of the very interesting aspects of quantum systems on, a, on microscopic to macroscopic scales. Quantum information, quantum computing, em emergent quantum phenomena, exotic quantum states of matter, and yes, macroscopic quantum mechanics, human-sized objects entangled quantum mechanically, manifesting quantum mechanical phenomena on a, on, a, on a macroscopic scale. And there are a lot of um, smiling, smiling faces of professors who will be happy to tell you about their work in this subject. I just flashed some of them. Here are some of our newest members. There's uh, um, Shi Chen uh, is joining us this, um, this fall. And oh, how about that? Look over here. There's um, uh, our, new our new president um, hiding behind um, what looks like a piece of apparatus for cooling his materials down to absolute zero, or very, very close to absolute zero. So there's a lot of activity in understanding macroscopic quantum mechanics here at Caltech. But I want to return to the physics of the very small and the physics of the very large and give another reason why they're actually very deeply connected. And that is that comes from cosmology. From studies of the evolution of the universe since the Big Bang, we've learned that what we see today, planets, stars, solar systems, galaxies, and, and the like, are, um, uh, are, uh, manif are, are manifestations of evolution over time uh, of the universe from its earliest moments. And it's in its earliest moments, the universe was hot and dense. And the laws that govern the material, the matter of the universe, were the fundamental forces of nature that are studied in particle physics.
And the evolution of matter and energy went along with the evolution of space and time. That's why in the Big Bang we can talk about the beginning of time and even the beginning of space and how uh, time and space are warped and expand uh, as the universe evolves. So what we learn is that you can't understand the physics of the very large, the entire universe, without understanding the physics of the very small, the fundamental forces that govern the matter that, um, uh, that um, uh, was in the soup, the primal soup of the early universe. So there's a deep connection between the physics of the very large and the very small. So instead of drawing the scales on a linear, well, on a logarithmic scale from very small to very large, one way you can draw it, a different way you can draw it is this way. Here's an, the Ouroboros of physics. This is one of those primal symbols that people have throughout um, history and, 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 and mythology, the, the snake swallowing its tail, the unity of all things. Um, and here it just illustrates, this is the physics version thereof, and it just illustrates that the physics of the very, very small, um, the W and Z, the atoms, the W and Z particles, the dark matter, the grand unified theories, and the physics of the very large stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies and the entire universe universe connect together somehow. They deeply connect together. And this is a, um, a, um, uh, a fascinating sort of unification of the physics of the very large and the very small that, that fascinates me and made it possible for me to, to, to um, go explore both regimes. So for a long time I studied the physics of the very small and then I decided that I wanted to learn more about gravity and how it works. And um, so I started to go into, um, uh, to, to try to understand Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is not an easy thing to understand. One of the things that it teaches you is that gravity governs everything. It affects everything. And it's described in Einstein's theory as due to the curvature of space, or the curvature of space and time. So here's a classic picture that many of you may have already seen. Uh, it's called an embedding diagram. Here's a massive object, and it's, embed and it's living in a two-dimensional space. We're going to take our three-dimensional space and just represent it as a two-dimensional plane. And then it's warping that plane in some other dimension that doesn't even really need to be there mathematically. In fact, probably isn't. It's just a warping of the space of, of this two-dimensional space. And that represents, let's say, the sun bending space around it, and this is a test particle, like the Earth, moving in a straight line through curved space. As a result, its motion becomes an almost perfect Keplerian ellipse. Don't worry, you'll learn all about Keplerian ellipses in Physics 1 very soon. And, um, uh, and so uh, uh, Einstein showed that at its, at its deepest level, this isn't an action at a distance force as, as Newton tried to describe it. It's, a, um, it's actually a local motion of a, a test particle in curved space. And um, the presence of matter tells space how to curve. And the spatial curvature tells matter how to move. And that's the essence of general relativity. This is the only equation that I'm putting up. It's one of our favorites. Uh, this is, Einstein, this is uh, uh, the fundamental um, equation of, uh, of general relativity that says that matter and energy warps space and time, and space-time warpage changes the motion of matter and energy. Um, one of the many of Einstein's predictions from, the early, uh, from his development of general relativity have been verified many, many times over. One still hasn't, and it's the prediction of the presence, the existence of gravitational waves. The idea of a gravitational wave is that instead of having, say, just one star, you might have two stars orbiting each other. And as they do, they're warping space, and the warping of space is changing with time, maybe very, very rapidly. And that rapidly changing space-time curvature, warping, propagates outward, carrying the news about, changing about this changing gravitational field of these two stars to distant observers. These waves of gravity, of space-time curvature, propagate at the same speed as the speed of light, not because they have anything to do with light at all, but because of the nature of space-time. Just so happens that light travels at the speed of gravitational waves, uh, at least so we think. And um, these uh, uh, gravitational waves are, um, were predicted by Einstein in, in 1916, almost 100 years ago. But he didn't believe that they would ever be observed. And so far, he's been right. But there's nothing physicists like better than to prove Einstein wrong. 
Um, and we intend upon doing that very soon, maybe in 2016, the centennial of the prediction of gravitational waves, would be a nice time to detect the stretching and squeezing of space, to, of space caused by passing gravitational waves for the first time. That's our plan, okay? Don't hold me to it, but that's our plan. That's what we intend upon doing. Now, we do know that gravitational waves exist because we have seen binary stars orbiting each other and losing energy. And um, as they lose energy, they spiral in um, uh, to one another. And that um, uh, has been observed over many, many years for a bunch of different systems. And the amount by which they lose energy is exactly as predicted by Einstein's uh, laws. So gravitational waves have never been directly observed by us as the stretching and squeezing of the space that we are in. But we know they exist because we know that they're emitted, carrying away energy and angular momentum from, st from binary stars in our galaxy. And in fact, that was a, um, uh, that was a I'm not going to go through all this, uh, that was a Nobel Prize for uh, Hulse and Taylor in 1993. Um, so, that, uh, so we know they exist, but to actually see and feel the stretching and squeezing of space caused by them as they pass through us is what our real goal is, our, what our goal is. Gravitational waves come from very, very rapidly changing gravitational fields. And the strongest ones come from very, very strong gravitational fields. And strong field gravity is, is of great interest to physicists because Einstein's equations have been solved and we understand them in weak fields. They've been tested quite a lot um, uh, in weak field gravity of our solar system. But they've never been tested where things get really interesting. Around black holes or the early moments of the Big Bang, the, uh, the, from the very earliest moments of the Big Bang. This is where the general theory of relativity gets nonlinear. This is where um, gravity becomes a source of gravity. It becomes a runaway thing, turning, um, uh, turning ordinary stars into black holes. It, it's where phenomena in nature get the most interesting when they are nonlinear. Um, now, we're not close to any black holes or, or the Big Bang, and maybe that's a good thing. Um, but we can learn about the nature of strong gravity and highly dynamical, rapidly changing gravity by studying the, um, what such systems emit. And it's not light. Curved space-time is not matter. And black holes are not matter. They're mass, but they're not matter. And when they orbit each other, all that's changing is gravity. All that's changing is space-time. And the way we can detect it is to search for radiation of curved space-time, gravitational waves. And that's our goal, is to look for these new ph phenomena that are new to us, new to our experience, that come from rapidly changing strong field gravity. What do we expect to find? Well, we're not sure, but I, we know the history of astronomy has been punctuated by major revolutions in our understanding just by opening up new wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so for thousands of years, we understood the universe by looking, or the, the, the physical universe beyond the Earth, by looking at the light from stars, visible light with our eyes. Then we discovered that if we uh, built infrared detectors and sent them into outer space, we could see not just ordinary stars, but star birth, the birth of young stars and star formation regions. When we looked with uh, microwaves, we saw the radiation from the Big Bang itself. It fills the universe. In fact, it dominates the radiation field of the universe. We'd never know it if we didn't have, if we didn't develop detectors to see beyond what human beings can normally see. When we, uh, ha all these things have to be done from space. The um, uh, gamma rays and X-rays tell us about the universe, um, a very violent, rapidly changing universe. Uh, um, the gamma ray sky is filled with high energy, um, very, very strong gravitational fields that are producing huge amounts of energy. The most energetic phenomenon in the universe, blind to us without X-ray telescopes in space. Gamma ray bursts are bursts of gamma rays that come from across the universe. They are the most energetic, the most violent phenomena that we know of in the universe. We, don't, we wouldn't know about any of those things if we didn't build telescopes uh, that, that look beyond the electromagnetic spectrum and, and took the trouble to send them into space. Now, gravitational waves are different. They're not just another band of the electromagnetic spectrum. They're a whole nother spectrum. 
They're a whole other phenomenon. And they're not like electromagnetism produced by the incoherent jiggling of electrons and atoms on the surface of stars. They come from the coherent motion of large masses orbiting each other, even if they emit no light at all. They come from the dark side of the universe. And the only way to study them is with, with a, a next generation of gravitational wave detectors. Now, gravitational waves also come in a spectrum from low frequencies to high frequencies. And um, the low frequency spectrum of gravitational waves come from very large things like the entire universe, things the size of the entire universe. And higher frequencies come from things, small things like stars, even small stars like neutron stars and black holes, which have maybe the mass of the sun in a size of Pasadena. So they're very, very dense, very strong field gravity. And they can orbit each other so fast, hundreds or thousands of times a second, that they can produce gravitational waves at, at, at 1,000 hertz. That's audio frequencies. You can actually hear it. At low frequencies, well, our brain isn't going to be able to hear those things, but our body can feel it. It's shaking. It's the space that we occupy, stretching and squeezing, shaking our body. It's something you can feel or hear, not just see. Um, and I'll, I'll mention a little bit about the devices that we're building, we've built to, to study these things. Okay, first LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. This was built by Caltech and MIT for the National Science Foundation and is now operated by Caltech, MIT, and the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, which is an international collaboration of almost a thousand physicists around the world. We have two um, observatories. Uh, one is in uh, eastern Washington state, one is in southern Louisiana. They're big. They are laser interferometers with arms at 45, at, at 90 degrees, and light bounces back and forth between these regions. And when a gravitational wave goes by, it stretches and squeezes the space between these mirrors, and we monitor that, and in that way we observe. Um, uh, uh, we, we look for evidence of a gravitational wave stretching and squeezing the space between these, uh, between these mirrors. These are big things. They need to be big in order to see these tiny, tiny effects of gravitational waves. So far, we've operated these things for a year, for, for 10 years, for 10 years. Here's one of them. This is LIGO Livingston Observatory. This is a house over here. Okay, that's how big these things are. They're four kilometers uh, on a side. Um, we've operated these things for 10 years. We have not detected gravitational waves. But in the last few years, we've upgraded them to advanced LIGO. And the advanced LIGO detectors are 10 times more sensitive. And I'm pretty confident that in the next couple of years, we will see the first evidence of gravitational waves stretching and squeezes, squeezing the space that these detectors and we occupy for the first time. And you'll, you'll hear about it if you're not the, working on it. And we're not the only ones doing this. All around the world, people are building detectors like this. And um, here are just some of them. Here's the LIGO detectors in the United States, LIGO Livingston and LIGO Hanford. Um, in Germany, uh, there's a 600 meter long L, that is an L, believe it or not, um, in, uh, outside of Hanover in Germany. Advanced Virgo is uh, under construction outside of Pisa in Italy. Uh, Kagra is under construction in the Japanese Alps underground. And we actually built three LIGO instruments. We put, we put one of them in, in, in Louisiana, one of them in, in uh, Washington, and a third is sitting in crates waiting to be shipped to India in the coming years. So this is a worldwide network of, of a new kind of telescope, a new kind of antenna to detect a new kind of radiation to tell us about the dark side of the universe. <laughs> it's not the only way to do it. You can take these detectors, and the, the, uni the world is shaking, and so it's kind of hard for us to detect tiny, tiny effects. Oh, and by the way, these tiny effects, let's see, what was the size of an atom again? 10 to the minus 10 meters. What was the size of a nucleus of an atom? 10 to the minus 18. The upper limit on the size of a, uh, 10 to the minus 15 meters. The upper limit on the size of a quark, 10 to the minus 18 meters. These devices can measure the stretching and squeezing of space at the level of about 10 to the minus 19 or 10 to the minus 20 meters. They are the most accurate measurement devices ever built. And we're going to operate them until we detect these, and keep improving them until we detect gravitational waves with them. 
But it's hard to do it on the Earth. You'd love to take these things and just throw them out into space. And the idea there is to build LIGO in space, of course. Uh, the laser interferometer space antenna. And there, those would not be four kilometers. Ah, who needs four kilometers? Those might be five million kilometers on a side. Uh, the orbit, not the Earth, the orbit, the Sun. And um, they are. Uh, um, and they'll be so sensitive that they'll be able to detect gravitational waves from, ac from across the galaxy and distant galaxies um, all the time. Tom Prince is one of the uh, um, uh, project scientists for that. On the, the, the downside here is that LISA is very expensive, mm, billions of dollars. So right now it's on hold, but we want to do it one day. We really do. It's going to be fantastic science. There's lots of things you can learn from gravitational waves. What you learn about is strong field, highly dynamical gravity. You learn about the most energetic phenomena in the universe. For example, binary stars, binary black holes orbiting each other and crashing into each other at the very end. Massive stars that explode in supernovas and produce bursts of gravitational waves in addition to a lot of light, which we do see. Um, Spinning neutron stars, these are incredibly interesting exotic materials in which gravity, the strong nuclear interaction, the weak nuclear interaction, and electromagnetism are all come into play together in one place. They all are in extreme regimes of density and energy and pressure, and, 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 um, uh, um, and they're, they're, it's, it's a fascinating laboratory. Fortunately, they're pretty far away, but we can study them, again, using gravitational waves. And even gravitational waves, perhaps, from the Big Bang itself. And I'll talk about some of those things. Now, we've been working on this for quite a while at Caltech. There have been lots of professors at Caltech and their groups who've been studying uh, gravitational waves. Um, here's our godfather over here, uh, you know, probing the dark side of the universe with his green laser pointer. Um, uh, that's Kip Thorne, uh, but many others that you'll see, you see around um, that you'll see around on campus. Please go up to them and ask them whether they like what they do. <laughs> now, neutron stars are really interesting things, but pairs of neutron stars orbiting each other get really exciting. I have sort of a video of that. Let's see if I can get it to work. Here's two neutron stars. They're orbiting each other very rapidly hundreds of times a second. This is slowed down for, your purpose, for, for, for our visual purposes. Notice that they're generating huge amounts of gravitational waves and then finally they crash into each other and make a gigantic explosion. These are, as far as we know, the most energetic explosions in the entire universe. The light from that explosion gets beamed in two different directions and if it happens to be beamed towards us, we can see these gamma ray bursts from across the universe. In fact, we see about one or two per day with space telescopes. They're fascinating objects, and the gravitational waves that come along with them will tell us quite a lot about the nature of neutron stars that we can't learn any other way. That light is going to be exciting to see, as well as the gravitational waves. We have a little scenario that we play out in our minds all the time. Here's the coalescence of a pair of neutron stars orbiting each other, losing energy and angular momentum by gravitational wave emission, getting closer and closer together until finally they smash into each other, making a gigantic gamma ray burst. Okay? We detect the gravitational waves even before the burst. We detect the gamma ray burst if it happens to be pointing towards one of our space telescopes, like Fermi or Swift. If not, then we don't see it with light unless we know to where to look. So with the LIGO detectors, we're going to figure out where to look and tell telescopes around the world to point in that direction and look for a transient optical rising and lowering of light coming from the direction that the gravitational waves come from. The so-called prompt optical emission and then the optical afterglow and the radio afterglow that can be seen with uh, radio telescopes as well. The best way to do this is with fully automated, powerful um, uh, telescopes that can uh, really distinguish transient events from run-of-the-mill stars or everything else. And the world's leaders of that are the Palomar Transient Factory, um, which uh, is operated out of Palomar Observatory, which is operated by Caltech. Here's a couple of Caltech professors that run PTF, and they are set up to immediately respond within seconds to a gravitational wave event alert, point 
the 48-inch um, uh, ocean telescope at, um, uh, at Palomar, and then the 60-inch and the 200-inch and beyond, uh, and find that faint afterglow. That's what we call multi-messenger astronomy. Gravitational waves, ordinary light, radio waves, gamma rays and x-rays, by observing phenomena, exotic and interesting phenomena, with many, many different probes, many, many different wavelengths of light and other things like gravitational waves, we will get a much deeper understanding of what these, um, what these uh, exotic phenomena really are. Some things you can't do that with. Black holes. Black holes are black. They don't emit light. There's no matter. There's no electrons. They're just invisible to light but not to gravitational waves. They emit gravitational waves all the time. And when black holes orbit each other in binary systems, well, there you've got what's called the two-body problem. <laughs> now, in, in physics, you will learn, physics one, you will learn, if you haven't already, the solution to the two-body problem in Newtonian physics. It's called center of mass coordinates. It works great. Not for gravity. For gravity, the two bodies that orbit each other are always losing energy. And solving the two-body problem is hard. You have to solve Einstein's equations. And I, solving Einstein's equations, there are only a few ways of doing it that we know of analytically. It's really hard to solve Einstein's equations for what happens when two stars orbit, two black holes orbit each other. It's really hard. So what we do is, we can't do it analytically. What we do is put it on supercomputers. And let me show you a, by the way, this, that, that video I showed you of binary neutron stars, that was an artist's conception, okay? That wasn't a real thing, okay? Now, this isn't a real thing either, except to a physicist. This is a real solution to Einstein's equations um, in, on, on supercomputers of two stars, black holes, orbiting each other. There's a lot in this, in, in this. I'll just whiz you through it. Here's two black holes orbiting each other. You can see they're tracing out their orbit, and you can see that the orbit is decaying. Okay, that's the in spiral of the two black holes. Below, you can see the curvature of space. You can see the twisting of time. You can see the velocity of the flow of space and time. All kinds of neat things. And down below, these are the gravitational waves that are emitted. They're just sinusoids, like this. They go at low frequencies. And then, as the black holes orbit each other closer and closer, um, they get close to merger. And when they do get close to merger, the two black holes start to kiss. <laughs> That's the merging of two black holes into one, which then emits a lot of gravitational waves as it rings down into a quiescent black hole. Oh, here's just two black holes kissing head on, because sometimes they do. Um, but the, um, the, oh, there's the kiss. Okay. Oh, my heart. Um, but the, the point is that this is uh, actually groundbreaking, what I just showed you. This um, solution to Einstein's equations is unique. Very few people know how to do it. It was first done here at Caltech. And the state of the art is, uh, is um, uh, by Mark Schiele and his group. Uh, and that's uh, the video that I just showed you. They live across the street. And they, um, they uh, know how to, how to actually solve the two-body problem uh, in Einstein's equations. Um, I should mention that that um, video, let's see if I can get it back. Um, that's, that waveform is in the audio band. You can listen to it. Let's see if we can listen to it. It starts out low frequency, low amplitude, and then it grows. <laughs> that little bit at the end, that was the kiss. OK, and that is what we are listening for with gravitational wave detectors. We can do more than just hear binary neutron stars or binary black holes. We can listen for explosions of massive stars as they, as uh, uh, as they burned, burn all of the, well, let's see. Here's a picture of a, of a, of a um, supernova remnant in our galaxy. There's the Cassé supernova remnant. Um, this is an, uh, uh, sort of a composite picture using space telescopes, including the Hubble telescope. And here's a computer simulation of what are particularly asymmetric 
supernova explosion might look like. This is done by Christian Ott across the street uh, here at Caltech. He blows up stars for a living. He's even got a blog about blowing up stars. That's what he, don't worry, don't worry. He does it on supercomputers. He's not gonna do it to your children. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but what, he dis what, what he's learning is, um, well, how stars blow up in the first place. And the fact that they blow up is kind of important because they spit out a lot of matter. You know, the matter in the universe is mainly hydrogen. And hydrogen is not very interesting. But in the core of stars, hydrogen burns to helium. Nuclear burning, not chemical burning. But it's what powers our, st our star. And for more massive stars, hydrogen burns to helium. Helium burns to carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and goes up and up until it burns to iron. And it can't burn beyond iron in the core of stars because iron is the most stable nucleus that we know of. Okay, so um, when, you, when a massive star in the core uh, burns, to, um, uh, burns to iron, the, the pressure, the gravitational pressure from the outer layers of the star, carbon, oxygen, all the way up to, to helium and hydrogen, pressing down on this iron core will cause it to implode and collapse into a neutron star or a black hole. That's the death of a massive star. And the outer layers blow out in these supernova, and they're rich in carbon and oxygen and nitrogen. Maybe hundreds of solar masses of the stuff, which then, collapse together gravitationally into second generation stars with planets and people. And that's us. We're made up of stardust from exploding stars. In fact, there was one over there about seven billion years ago that blew up and made our solar system, our second generation solar system. And that's sort of why Christian cares about these things. Um, and there's all kinds of interesting things because what's left behind is a dead star, a neutron star. And um, that neutron star is really fascinating. Its outer layers are iron, but its inner layers are nuclear matter in a sort of, a, in, in a sort of a extremely dense and constrained state. In fact, over here you can see that um, this is pure neutron fluid, this pink stuff, and this um, blue stuff is um, neutrons and protons and iron and stuff like that. And, um, uh, and what's happening is that it's stretched and squeezed and by gravitational forces so much that the different states of this matter um, form these tubes and then layers and then balls, all kinds of different. Um, um, this is um, sort of spaghetti and this is the lasagna and here's the, um, here's the meatballs. This whole thing is called nuclear pasta and it's fascinating stuff and the only way to study it is with, is with um, uh, neutron stars or better having neutron stars smash into each other and release all this matter and energy as well as uh, in light and in gravitational waves, as well as in matter and energy. Um, and that's how we can learn about, well, you know, exotic states of nuclear matter that you can't study any other way. Like I said, here's what we are made of. Okay, now the, again, the, the universe was mainly hydrogen once upon a time, but the heavier elements were all forged in the cores of massive stars and they were distributed to the interstellar medium by core collapse supernova, the thing that um, uh, Christian Ott uh, studies. That's star death. But it's not the only star death, because you can take these dead stars, like two neutron stars, and like that artist conception I showed you, they can orbit each other, lose energy and angular momentum by gravitational waves, smash together, and make a whole new death. And that whole new death it um, uh, um, uh, can actually produce even heavier elements than iron. You can get some heavier elements than iron um, uh, from uh, supernovas, but most of these heavier elements, let's see, I'm gonna show this, is Christian here? He's gonna yell at me if I show this because he says it's very preliminary. Um, but you know, when two neutron stars smash into each other, they do make a gigantic mess of material. And that's very neutron rich material. And what happens to that neutron rich material? Here's a little video that one of Christian's students made, and you know, it's very preliminary, but so what? It really does prove the point. Here, 
are the heavy nuclear rich elements that are being generated within milliseconds of it and then within about a second those heavy elements decay into things that have more of an equal balance of protons and neutrons and eventually into the stable nuclei that make up ordinary matter that we see on Earth. The ordinary matter that we see on Earth that are the so-called rare earth elements, okay? Which includes some of our favorites like, you know, gold and platinum and, and, and uranium and stuff like that. So we are made up of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen. That comes from core collapse supernova, which leave behind neutron stars. But the neutron stars, when they bash together, make even heavier elements. And we, and my ring, is not just stardust. This is neutron stardust. So we can really learn a lot about ourselves by learning about these very exotic things far removed from the human experience. The far, how far do you get from the human experience? Gra um, the Big Bang. We've learned quite a lot about the Big Bang um, from uh, uh, work done at Caltech and elsewhere. For example, this is a sort of picture, a baby picture of the universe at the earliest moments, well, maybe 400,000 years after the Big Bang, um, in, in which the cosmic microwave background, microwave radiation, which fills the universe, is more or less uniformly coming at us from all directions. But if you build a carefully enough telescope, you can um, see small changes, a part in, 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 like micro Kelvin changes uh, in, the, um, in the temperature of the universe looking in different directions. This comes from the very earliest moments of the universe that we've been able to observe with electromagnetic radiation. It's been studied quite a lot and using it, Andrew Lang at Caltech discovered that the um, uh, the overall, overall geometry of the universe is not curved like a sphere or curved outward like a saddle but is instead very close to being perfectly flat which we didn't know until just a few years ago but there's more that you can learn because this radiation comes from 400,000 years after the Big Bang what about the very moment of the Big Bang the very moment of the Big Bang like 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang which is the Planck time we don't even know how to get below that um, the fabric of the universe, space and time, were roiling with energy. And that was producing huge amounts of gravitational waves. And then as the universe expanded, those gravitational waves dissipated away, but they're still around. I mean, they didn't dissipate, they just spread out. They're still around, and we want to look for them. And those are hard to see, but one thing that it'll do is make imprint an, a tiny pattern on this cosmic microwave radiation. And that tiny pattern appears in the polarization of this radiation. And for the first time, about six months ago, these guys, Jamie Bach and Sunil Gawala, used a telescope in the South Pole to observe that tiny polarization swirling of the cosmic microwave uh, uh, radiation background. And we believe that, that, that this swirling of polarization patterns comes from gravitational waves from the very earliest moments of the universe, from 10 to the minus 12 or 10 to the minus 43 perhaps, to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. We're not sure, the jury is still out on this. There will be more experiments and more observations, some of which Jamie is working on, that will tell us whether indeed what he's seeing is the effect of gravitational waves in the early universe. But it really will open our eyes, will really feel um, what, um, uh, what, uh, how gravitational waves have influenced uh, the world in which we live. So I want to return, finally, to this Ouroboros of physics over here. It still bugs me, it bugs me. And the reason why it bugs me is because I was using it to illustrate the unity of the physics of the very, very small and the physics of the very, very large. Way over here is us. Whoa, that doesn't seem right. The physics of the very large and the physics of the very small, they're us. They're what, they're, they help us understand who we are and the world in which we live, not just from a human perspective, but from a bigger perspective than that. So somehow the morphology of this whole thing is wrong. Maybe it would look better like this. And um, 
so you know, here, here we're just illustrating that you are not just in the middle, <laughs> but you're also at both ends. In other words, you can feel, you can see, you can feel, and you can um, smell it all using extensions of your senses that come from scientific research. And that's not just you, but it's really that most complicated thing that we know of in the entire universe, which is your brain. And not just your brain, but your brain at Caltech, which can actually <laughs> cover the whole thing, at least we hope it will cover the whole thing, and even add to, I don't know, what's happening over here? Can you fill that in? Okay, there's a lot more that we need to understand, and I leave it to you, so welcome. Thank you. I'm done? Yeah, this okay. is well, I think that you all know now that what physics is all about at Caltech, and I hope that you will find that every other discipline is actually just as exciting. So you have a huge choice in front of you. Uh, in addition, I think what you can take away from this is that the enthusiasm of our professors for their research is absolutely terrific. This, was a, this is an all-time high to see these things for you, so I hope that you'll enjoy it and remember it when you're doing problem sets that are not so exciting, right? <laughs> this, is, this is where it will take you eventually. And so at this point, actually, I would like to um, close our um, uh, convocation for this afternoon. I want to thank you all personally um, for coming today, um, those of you who are just visiting, and those of you who are here for the long haul, um, I'd like to welcome you again to the community. Um, I'm going to show, particularly for the undergraduates, um, a little video now to end this uh, this uh, convocation, which is about something called Ditch Day, which you may already have heard about if you have come to Frosch Camp. Uh, it, Ditch Day takes place uh, sometime in the third quarter, and I can't tell you when, but if you ask people, you'll, you will find out that it's usually tomorrow. And so don't worry about that. You will know when it's happening. People will tell you when it's going to be tomorrow. Um, in addition, um, once this has finished, most of you may leave, but I'd like to ask our new undergraduates and their parents to stay behind as everyone else leaves after the video. Um, and because the Dean of um, Undergraduate Students, John DeBerry, who's also a professor of aeronautics and bioengineering, um, has a special announcement for our new students and their parents. And he'll be making that and telling you what will happen uh, next, after the end of this. So everyone can leave but undergraduates and their parents. We'd like to stay behind for the undergraduate deans. That would be wonderful. And with that, thank you again for coming. I look forward to getting to know new students. I hope I won't see you all as disciplinary issues, but in happier circumstances. And so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, this is always a great moment. Thank you again.